Hi everyone, uh, my name is Omer Çelebeoğlu. I'm going to give a brief overview of HPC storage, how we can approach HPC storage, and then my colleagues are going to go talk about uh, some specific examples, details of implementations and uh, the challenges that they have. I can't advance the slides to this. Here we go. Uh, so storage is needed in every HPC configuration. Basically, at a minimum, you have some place to store your home directories, your application data, uh, and all the different files that are associated with your applications. Uh, but there may be more to it, depending on the application's needs and characteristics. Uh, you may require uh, certain access speeds to your storage. Uh, you may need to architect your storage uh, in a scalable fashion so that you can expand it as your application's needs grow. So you always have to take these into account. You may have to provide a certain level of reliability, resiliency, because your applications uh, require that. Uh, you need to take all those parameters into account when designing your HPC I.O. subsystem, storage subsystem. Uh, but when doing that, you also need to consider the practical aspects such as computation and cost, uh, so, uh, cost and uh, manageability. You cannot design the HPC subsystem in such a way that it's cost prohibitive to implement or, or it becomes completely unmanageable. So here's a example of an HPC configuration. This is uh, a rather simple 256 node cluster with uh, your com compute nodes uh, basically uh, denoted here. Uh, you have a master node that's used for access to outside uh, and it's used to provision your cluster, manage your cluster, submit your jobs. And then in the middle here you have the I.O. subsystem. Uh, what we have seen happen over the years is computation has gotten uh, bigger and bigger, faster and faster. Uh, we have uh, more cores in the systems now, uh, faster cores, more capable cores. Uh, but we have not paid as much attention traditionally to storage uh, when we architect these clusters. So it's becoming an issue uh, to make sure we can keep all those cores busy. Uh, it's important to design these clusters in a balanced way so that you have enough storage to house your data and then you can get that data to your compute nodes, compute nodes fast enough so that uh, they keep busy and they're working efficiently. So in doing that, there are different ways of approaching HPC storage and building a shared uh, I.O. subsystem. Now I'm going to talk about some of those and advantages and disadvantages of each. Uh, the simplest way is you know, using NFS. Basically, you configure uh, one of your servers as an NFS gateway. You attach some direct attach storage behind it, like JBots or uh, some SAS uh, RAID capable uh, arrays. And then uh, you export it via NFS to your cluster. Since uh, NFS clients come free in the Linux OS, uh, it's very simple. Everybody understands uh, this methodology. It's uh, easy to manage, uh, relatively lower cost uh, to deploy and maintain. Uh, the biggest disadvantage with this picture, of course, is that uh, this is not scalable. So you're band limited by what this single server can provide. And in terms of the overall storage that you can put behind it, you're limited by what your ext3, xfs, uh, or whatever local file system can provide. Uh, the other obvious disadvantage in this picture is that you have a single storage uh, serving I.O., therefore you have a single point of failure. Uh, there are certain things that you can do to uh, alleviate that. You can add a second NFS server and deploy failover functionality, such as using 
Linux HA, so that if one of the NFS servers fail, uh, the other one can take over. Uh, it can, as I mentioned, alleviate some of the aspects, but still uh, you're pretty limited in terms of scalability. But uh, it's a good choice. A lot of people use, most people use NFS uh, because it's, as I mentioned, uh, simple to implement and uh, lower cost. Second approach is uh, using a SAN file system. This is typically what we see in enterprise environments as opposed to uh, high performance computing. Uh, in this picture, all your servers have access to block storage uh, via the fabric. This could be a fiber channel fabric or you could implement it using iSCSI over uh, standard uh, Ethernet uh, fabrics. Uh, and then uh, your compute nodes uh, directly access storage. But for this to work, you need a SAN-based file system, uh, such as you know, GFS, uh, Storenext, on and so forth. Uh, this is better performance in comparison to NFS because you don't have that single server that's acting as the gateway. Uh, but the obvious advantage is that you need a SAN. If you add fiber channel, the costs increase, uh, you are using a, a SAN-based file system, so there are support costs associated with it that you need to consider for each of your compute nodes. And also for uh, certain write-intensive patterns, uh, this may create uh, more locking overhead. So the performance may not be as good for certain type of uh, workloads either. So that's why I think this is not very common in uh, HPC. but. Uh, you can deploy a SAN-based file system in the back end and export NFS from these uh, multiple uh, nodes to your cluster, which is sitting above here, uh, to have a scalable uh, NAS type of environment. And the third approach is using a parallel file system. In a parallel file system, uh, the data flows through multiple access points, which may be called I.O. nodes, or different implementations have uh, different names for it. Uh, each I.O. node will have dedicated storage behind it. Uh, this can be as simple as internal hard drives. You can have external JBots. You can have uh, more like a SAN type environment behind this. But the idea is similar to HPC uh, for computation, basically how with MPI, you distribute your job and uh, run it across multiple nodes to get better computational throughput. In this picture, you distribute your I.O. load across multiple servers uh, to get better I.O. throughput. And some implementations of parallel file systems also uh, allow you to stripe a single uh, file across multiple nodes to get higher throughput for a single file, similar to striping a file on a, a RAID, basically, you do a, a cluster file system level uh, RAID, if you will. Uh, typically, you will have a meta metadata server uh, that uh, holds the metadata and uh, basically tells the compute nodes where their files sit. So once they get the metadata information, they can communicate directly with the I.O. nodes. Uh, some other implementations may distribute the metadata as well as the data uh, on the I.O. servers as well. So there are different ways to go about it, but the general idea is to provide better scalability and uh, better uh, throughput, better uh, performance via distribution. Uh, so we talked about all the advantages. Some of the disadvantages may be uh, more complicated uh, than obviously implementing a single NFS. You may need a proprietary uh, software on the uh, client nodes. So it may be uh, more costly and less manageable than uh, a single NFS server environment, obviously. So going back to this picture again, uh, if we look at the middle of the picture, this is where your I.O. subsystem is implemented. You have multiple I.O. nodes, and behind it, you have direct attach uh, storage. So 
this kind of an architecture allows you to scale computation independently of communication. So if your computational needs grow, you can add more I.O. nodes here. Or if your uh, I.O. needs grow, sorry, uh, if your computational needs grow, you add more computation nodes. If your I.O. needs grow, you add more I.O. nodes. Or maybe your I.O. performance need remains the same and your capacity needs grow. Then you can keep the same number of I.O. nodes and add more storage behind it. So it's a more scalable architecture that lets you uh, invest in uh, which area of the cluster uh, is more important to you at that time. So if we, uh, we looked at how different implementation methods exist, if we also look at the usage models, uh, you can uh, basically have different types of usage models for storage uh, in your HPC environment. Uh, you can have uh, a near-line storage uh, area where your throughput needs are not that high because maybe you host your uh, home directories over here and maybe your uh, application files over here. But depending on the size of the cluster, depending on number of users, depending on the applications, you can have uh, the needs in terms of capacity uh, be from small to very large. Uh, you may also choose to implement your home directories uh, with a different type of storage architecture using the parallel file system that we described. Uh, if your uh, access, if your need to access home directories is uh, uh, high, uh, and then you may choose to implement a scratch space, which uh, you don't put your uh, data on it long term, but use when applications are running uh, for applications to uh, basically do, uh, do their I.O. during the application run and then move that data once the applications are done to your uh, nearline storage or archive. Uh, so archive is the one that's most capacity intensive and least throughput intensive. Basically, when you're done with a, a certain data set, but you want to keep it around for a while, uh, and you're not going to access it very frequently, so you don't require it to uh, be on your fastest storage, you can put it uh, in your archive, which can be implemented using tape drives uh, or other, uh, uh, other implementations uh, that are lower cost per gigabyte, but uh, high in capacity. So here's one example of how this could work, how this can be implemented uh, in, in practice. Basically, you have your data, and when your data comes in, uh, you put your raw data set uh, on your fastest uh, storage. So this can be your scratch space, if you will. Once that data is staged on scratch space, uh, your application runs and uh, does the computation using that scratch space uh, storage. And then once that's done, you can move the results uh, to your permanent storage. And this could be a single uh, NFS uh, interface. And this could be more of a, a parallel file system. You, know, you may have InfiniBand for uh, fast access using RDMA uh, so that you maximize throughput. Uh, over here also you could use either Tangigi or uh, IP or IB to access your resilient storage as well. So computation is done, we move the data to the permanent storage. Uh, then you can have a visualization cluster maybe connected to your cluster to visualize that data. And then this centralized storage acts as a repository that allows you to share that data between the visualization cluster and your compute cluster. And then once everything is done, maybe you have some policies set that say once the age of the data exceeds several months, several weeks, uh, what have you, uh, you move that data to the archive storage, but then you leave some traces called stops uh, on your uh, permanent storage. Uh, so that whenever needed, you can retrieve that data uh, very quickly. Uh, but then that data is not going to come 
as fast as coming from your uh, 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 near line storage tier. So just to reiterate, some of the aspects of the scratch space is uh, it's for more I.O. intensive applications uh, to run uh, uh, and during the application run provide uh, fast access to storage, but you don't have to implement it in a very resilient way. You can use uh, more cost optimized hardware uh, because it's only active during the application run and the data is not going to be stored on it for a long time. So that allows you to save some cost in uh, implementing that. Uh, the second tier that we talked about is the resilient storage tier. It doesn't have to be as fast as your uh, scratch space because your application performance is not necessarily uh, very dependent on it. But you really want that to be more resilient, easy to manage, uh, so you can invest in those areas as opposed to uh, making it super fast. And then the third area that we talked about online ar uh, archiving is where you need capacity. So you invest more in capacity and less and less in performance. Uh, but then, of course, uh, this picture that I showed requires pretty intelligent software to make sure what's happening in the background is uh, abstracted and the users uh, can work seamlessly. So in summary, uh, we all need storage. We, can't, we cannot ignore the storage needs of the cluster when building our clusters. You have to build a balanced environment. Uh, there are different ways to approach storage, and there is no single solution. There's no one size that fits all, basically. So depending on your needs, depending on your users' needs, applications' needs. Uh, you need to uh, profile and uh, you need to pick the right components that form the best solution for your environment. Any questions before I uh, hand it off to my colleagues?